Hello. How's everyone doing? Good weekend? All right. I might be slightly tired today. My uh, my grandfather passed away on Thursday or early Friday morning. So I was in New York all weekend. I got home like at midnight last night. So I'm... What's that? Let's just rest today. <laughs> No, no, not going to happen. <laughs> I was either going to be here or do it by video, so you get it either way. Uh, so if I'm slightly less energetic than normal, please uh, please forgive me if I'll do my best to keep it exciting. But we ease. Okay. All right. Any questions about stuff we covered last week? Anything lingering? Anything? Okay. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to start a new topic called servitudes. And I think the hardest part of this topic is actually going to be terminology. And the reason why it's going to be difficult is that nothing means what it means in different contexts. And allow me to explain. So in any given, uh, I'm just pulling something up for later. In any given case we do this year, or this, this topic, the same concept can be called three or four different things. And it will confuse the hell out of you. So, and a lot of people did this on the exam, and I told them not to do it, they did it anyway. On the exam, I will tell you what the interest is. If I say it's an easement, it's an easement. If I say it's a covenant, it's a covenant. A lot of people, not a lot, maybe like four or five people on the exam, I wrote something that was an easement, and they treated it as a covenant. And they said, well, but it sounded like a covenant. I said, but I called it an easement. So I'm telling you right now, if I called it an easement, it's an easement. If I call it a covenant, it's a covenant. If I call it a restrictive whatever, it's whatever I call it. And use that analysis. That way you won't lose points on the exam because a couple of people, they, they lost almost entire credit on the entire sections because they did the wrong analysis. And I, I couldn't have made it more clear. Prende, got that? Okay. So, but I will try to explain to you the various nuances of why an easement is different than a covenant and why a covenant is different than an affirmative easement and a negative easement. I'll try to do my best, but... But, but, but for you to know, the exam, I'll be very clear what kind of servitude something is. All right, everyone go with that? Um, I unfortunately left, left my seating chart upstairs, so I'm still <laughs> going to get it, so I'm just going to have to point, and maybe I remember some of your names. So where did I finish last time? Anyone remember? Valentine's Day? Anyone remember? Someone just pointed. <laughs> you? you? I can start. All right, I'll, I'll start back corner, okay? It's the fairest place to start. Uh, you got a minute, though. I'm not going right away, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a question about easements in a minute, okay? Okay. So, um, like most things, like most things in property law, everything we do is derived from stupid feudal history. I'm doing um, estates and fee simple and in uh, property one, so I have this fancy diagram. But almost everything we have now in property law is a... Uh, is a derivative of how things were in jolly old England. So back on the medieval manor, you had a lot of land. And land was allocated in various different ways. Um, what they would usually do is it would take a plot of land, divide up into these strips. And they would assign a person non-contiguous strips. What does that mean? Well, one person might have this strip from the fallow field, one have my this strip from the spring field, uh, one, one, one field here from the fall planting. They'd have various strips of land in various places. <coughs> in addition, they'd have what were called commons. So these were common pastures. That's where you could bring your, 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 your chickens to graze and your cows to graze and your, you could water your cows and water your chickens and your pigs. They had various meadows, they had various forests. So if you needed trees, you could cut it down. The key thing, though, about the, the medieval manor was that the Lord owned everything, and this is nothing new. The Lord owned everything. And then the serfs, or the villains, were allowed to use a very small portion. But the serfs did not really need permission to go to the, to the common pastures. That was implied in their ability to bring it. So if they wanted to bring their ox to you know, plow a field, they could cross someone else's field. There would be no problem. On the medieval manor, this worked just fine. Why? Because it was a common owner. But as the feudal system began to collapse uh, uh, during the Middle Ages and later into the Renaissance era, this became difficult. Why did it become difficult? Well, let's see. Uh, my, my, my chart's upstairs. Yes, sir? What's that? Justin. Justin, why did it become difficult? What, what aspect of the destruction of the feudal system made this difficult? Yeah. 
I might not be the reading, but if you think about it, why can this system where everyone can go wherever they want, why would that not work? The feudal system is gone. Uh, well, I guess people can interfere with what other people are doing on their parts of the land. Right. That's right. So when you have a common owner and he says, okay, I'm going to leave that part to be a common pasture. Everyone can water their chickens there. And I'm going to give this part to John and this part to Bill. Everyone kind of knows where they're supposed to go. What happens when people move off the manor and buy their own land? What happens then? That land they were on is left. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, speak. Um, do you like when people cross onto your land? What do you do to prevent people from crossing onto your land? Fences. Anyone here with the expression, good fe high fences make good neighbors? <laughs> The idea of the fence, as simple as it sounds, did not exist on the feudal manor. Look, there are no fences. I have, I, have an, I have a better picture here. Everything was basically wide open. Anyone who lived on the manor can go wherever they want. If they want to go to the common fields, they can go to the common fields. If they want to go to the lake, they can go to the lake. If they want to go crop, they can go crop. There was no private ownership. But with the destruction of the feudal system, that ended. People started owning their own land. And if you own your own land, you don't want someone else on your land. That's something which I think Texans will appreciate more than any other people. You want to have your own land to yourself. You don't want some jerk bringing his chickens onto your land to, to go into the lake, or you don't want some guy bringing his stinky cows into your, into your little pond to clean themselves. <coughs> so what do we do? We build fences. Okay? <coughs> we enclose our property. But just because we enclose our property doesn't mean we want everyone out. So, um, sir, why, why would someone allow someone else onto the land to say what are their chickens or to, to, to graze? What, under what circumstances would, would, would the landowner allow that to happen? No, but what, what has to happen to get that easement? And what does that agreement come with? Why would someone make that agreement? Good. Money. Money. Or, or some other mutual benefit. So what this does is it allows people to specialize. So say we have two different pieces of land, right? And I'm going to use these examples or, or examples over and over again. We have wet acre, which has a lake on it, and then we have dry acre, which has a lot of access to sunlight, right? <laughs> if you have a cow you want to water and you live on dry acre, you can't, so you bring it to wet acre. Say you have, you know, uh, you, you don't have enough energy, you want to have a solar plant, you can put the solar panel on dry acre because there's sun, or, or grow crops, whatever you want. But it's very often the case that different pieces of land have different advantages, and people can trade from those advantages to, to create gains. The way this is accomplished is through the concept of a servitude. It's saying, okay, listen, buddy, you got this land that has this benefit. I have this land that has this benefit. Let's make a deal. Now, it can be, I'm going to pay you $1,000 a year to water my chickens here, or I'm going to let you install a solar panel in my backyard so you can water your chickens. There are various ways of making this kind of transaction. But originally, servitudes had to deal with, <coughs> I'm going to either let you do something on my land, or I'm not going to do something on your land. Or I'm going to do this if you do that. And there are various ways of making these arrangements. And we'll get to the details in a minute. But does everyone kind of get what the concept of servitude is. It's saying someone else has something in their land that can benefit or harm me, and I'm going to control what they can do. Generally, I can't tell someone else what to do, but the servitude is effectively a land contract that says, I will control what you do in your land for a price of some sort. All right, everyone okay with that? So let's start getting some terminology in. Um, and again, I don't want you to get too bogged down because a lot of these terms overlap significantly. There are big differences, but, there, but there's a lot of overlap. So, oh, and one other note. I, I mentioned before uh, the idea of cosine bargaining, where people can negotiate to use your lands in the most optimal ways. This is a very good example, because that's like someone saying, all right, my land does this to you, your land does this to me, we make an agreement. You know. If, you, if you're polluting smoke onto my land, right, I'm going to pay you not to do that. I'm going to restrict your ability to use your land as you see fit for my benefit. Or say, uh, 
one hotel wants to build a hotel to block the sunlight of another, they can say, okay, if you do that, you have to pay me. I'm going to get, I'm going to pay for, <laughs> and basically you'll pay for my right to block your sun. And this has been a historical way of negotiating these kinds of transactions. Okay? So let's get some terminology. Um, Ma'am, you just walked in? I'm sorry, I forgot my seating chart. Yeah, so what's a servitude? Broadly speaking. <laughs> okay. No, you're good. You're good. That's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good. Perfect. Right. So, so broadly speaking, it's the burden. It's either the burden or the benefit. One land places on another. And keep in mind that's either a burden or a benefit. <coughs> so, say for example, I have a factory, right, and I acquire servitude, saying, listen, I'm going to be polluting, right? So I'm going to pay for my right to pollute. I will pay you a thousand dollars a year because I'm going to be polluting your lake. That would be a burden. But it can also be a benefit because they listen, I have a lake <coughs> on my property, right? I am going to allow you to bring your chickens onto my lake to get water. That's a benefit. But who's a benefit to? Um, sir? Mohammed. So, so let, let's break this down a little bit. I have a lake on my land, right? And I say, listen, you have your chickens, you live in a dry piece of land, I'm going to let you bring your chickens to my lake, right? Who gets the benefit? The person, uh, with the lake, or the person letting, the person that's letting all the land. Yeah, the guy with the chickens. Yeah, the guy with the chickens. Right. The guy with the chickens is getting the benefit. Who's getting the burden? The guy with the chickens. Because I get these smelly chickens in my land. Keep that in mind. So there's always going to be a benefit and a burden. This is simple reality. If one person's getting a benefit, that comes at the cost of someone else. If I'm letting your stinky chickens onto my farm, there's going to be a burden for me. But that's not a problem because we can pay for that around it. Okay? So, sir, let's let's start off. What is broadly what's an e what's an easement? Just um, just broad, broadly speaking. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 a type of a servitude that allows you to burden or benefit someone else's land. And I'm not going to write a definition because there's no good one sentence definition. But we're going to spend like three days on it. But it's a way of burdening or benefiting a piece of land. Okay, and there's going to be a subtle difference between an easement and a covenant. Um, uh, Stephen, roughly speaking, what's a covenant? Um, I was looking at all of these as if they were the same thing. But it was close enough. Yeah. Where you have the right to use somebody's land for something. Right. So the differences between an easement and a covenant, I can't type, are they're slight. They're not big. And in fact, I don't even want to get into the difference because we'll spend like four days on covenants. And I'll explain to you in depth what they are. The the the, the thing you can keep in the back of your mind is that covenants so called run with the land, that when they transfer from one party to the next, the covenant remains. So there's a covenant on a piece of land, it's gonna be there forever. Whereas an easement does not go like that. It's one, one difference. Okay, we'll we'll do several days on covenants, so I don't want to get too much into it. Um, the book also talks about these real covenants, which are covenants at law, versus equitable servitude, which are covenants in equity. Don't worry about those now. We'll I'll bore you with them later in a couple weeks. Okay. There are also um, uh, two other things called profits and licenses. I don't think we ever come back to those. This is just a way of saying. Say you have a forest with some trees, and a profit or a license will allow me to retrieve those. Uh, it could also happen with, say you have some minerals in your land. You think, listen, I will allow you onto my land to collect minerals. That can be a, that can be a license. I don't think we'll come back to that, but just, just know those terms. It might be, might be relevant for some of your future um, uh, research. Okay. So within easements, there's generally, broadly speaking, two kinds of easements, or, or 
two categories, I guess, better to say. So there's an affirmative easement, and there's a negative easement. And again, th these are very amorphous terms, but they might help you to distinguish who's getting the benefit and who's getting the burden. Okay? So, um, sir? So, say I own a farm, right, and you own a factory. I pay for an easement and say, listen, I'm going to pay you $1,000 a year to reduce your pollution, and you accept that. Okay, so I have the farm, you have the factory. How would we characterize that kind of easement? Uh, would be a negative easement. Why? Because you're essentially paying somebody to stop doing something on their land. Right. And benefit someone else. Yes. So, so the key for a negative is that it, is you're basically you're paying uh, someone else to uh, limit the use of their own land. Ba basically. So I'm saying to him, I have a farm. I'm sick and tired of this pollution. You stop polluting, or you pollute less, and I'll give you money. That would be an example of a negative easement. Now, uh, so to the next, uh, but an affirmative easement, what happens if I say, listen, I live on a dry piece of land, and you live on a wet piece of land? So you tell me, hey, listen, Josh, you come onto my property, you can water your chicken, just give me $100 a month. How would we characterize that? That's an affirmative easement. That's an affirmative easement, which is basically <coughs> paying to let someone else use your land. So this way, I can bring my chickens onto his farm, and I can water them there, and I'm going to pay him for that right. These are, these are nebulous categories, but these help to explain who's getting the benefit and who's getting the burden. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, in the affirmative easement, you're getting paid Yeah. The person who's getting the, 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 the burden is usually getting paid. People don't let smelly chickens in their land for free. Right. So they might get paid with money, they might get paid with land, maybe they might get paid with an easement onto the other guy's property. There are various ways of, of transacting these deals. But you're getting something. You don't, you don't do anything for free. Nothing in life is free. No free lunch. Yes, sir? What about like things owned by the city? Um, right, yeah, so, so if the government wants to put a, a, a light pole in your land or telephone cable or sewage system, the city has to obtain what's called a, an easement or a public easement. Um, and they can obtain those a couple ways. One, they have to pay you for it. So if the city wants to build a <coughs> pole on your land, on your property, they have to pay you the fair market value. We'll do this when we come to the takings unit. Now, say you don't want to sell it to them. Then the government can use what's called the power of eminent domain to seize the land from you, saying, I don't care if you say no, we're going to give you the money, you're going to give us this poll. So you, you can't say no to the government. They want to buy your land, you're forced to. But if the government... But the government has the easement. The government holds the easement, yeah. So say that you want a sewage connection <coughs> for your property, like the case we're doing in a few minutes. You can't tell the government, no, I will not let you put a sewage pipe under my house. If they want to, they're going to do it. The question is whether they're going to do it kicking and screaming, or you're just let them do it voluntarily. If you make them do a kicking and screaming, they'll take you to court and they'll win. Because the government has the power to condemn private land. Especially for something public like a utility or, or sewage line. That makes sense? Yeah. So in any given piece of property, you can have an easement in favor of the government, you can have an easement in favor of a landowner, there can be lots of easements. And all these are recorded in the deeds. Jennifer, when you were doing uh, title searches, I bet you loved finding all the various easements, didn't you? Pain in the neck, right? Yeah, because basically these are things that cloud a title. This is why a person might not have fee simple, because if there's 25 different easements on his land, and a couple of covenants, and a couple of these and that, there's a lot of people who might have an interest in that land if a person dies, or they want to sell a property. <coughs> okay? How's everyone doing with that? It'll be, it's easy now. It'll get worse in a few minutes. <laughs> I, I promise you. But everyone okay with just the general terminology? Don't worry about the covenants now. We'll come back to that in a, in a week or two. And unfortunately, again, the reason why we have these various terms is a matter of history. Because after the fall of feudalism, landowners started saying, okay, you know what? If this serf is not living on my land, I don't want to using my pastors. So they, so they started selling up easements. And then the common law judges didn't like the easements because they found that they were restricting the ability to get access to land. So then the landowners came with covenants, which were more tough, and saying, listen, this is going to be here forever. And then the judges said, we don't like covenants. And they came up with equal servitude. 
So all these various legal forms were created to try to keep people off the, off the land of wealthy people. This, this is the origin of, of land use, um, and it's still, still with us today. Okay, everyone good with that? Right, let's, do, let's do a couple more terms then, if, if I may. Okay, so, so let's see. Uh, where were we? Okay. So another term that, or two terms I want to distinguish. One of the trickiest things about understanding the easements is trying to understand who's getting the benefit and who's getting the burden, right? So the examples I just used before. The first example. So if I have a power plant, and I'm polluting, right? And there's a farm downstream. And he pays saying, hey, stop polluting. The person getting the benefit is the farm. And the person getting the burden is the uh, power plant, right? That's easy. Or the other example. If I'm letting someone else bring their chickens into my land, my land, I'm getting the burden because stinky <laughs> chickens are here. And the, guy, the farmer with the chickens is getting the benefit. So we can often ask, who's getting the benefit, who's getting the burden? But it's not always that simple of saying which person is getting the burden. Because back in the olden days, we didn't talk in terms of people. We talked in terms of property. All the benefits and burdens of life were attached to property. This is why we say fee simple is to A and his heirs. This isn't just to A. It's to his heirs and perpetuity, whoever owns this piece of land. Whatever, whatever person owns this land gets the benefits. So keep that in mind, because that will make it a little bit easier. And that brings us to these other two terms. Mm -hmm. Easement and gross is the easy one. This simply says that the benefit of the easement goes to a person. So this, one, this one's easy enough. So to use the example before, say if we had an easement and gross saying, listen, I want to bring my chickens from Black Acre to White Acre, <laughs> White Acre has some water on it. If it was an easement in gross, and the farmer moved somewhere else, he no longer lives on Black Acre, he could still bring his chickens. Why? Because the benefit of the easement resides in a person. The easement appurtenant is the opposite. The benefit resides in the piece of land. What does that mean? Whoever happens to live on that plot of land gains the easement. So if you transfer the easement from one person to the next to the next, <coughs> the easement remains with the land. Yes, ma'am. If you have an easement, though, and it's like a transfer for money, like in that case, then wouldn't that be a benefit? What do you mean? landowner, like if you're receiving cash for allowing... Don't think in terms of money. Think of jolly old England where money didn't exist. Think of terms and burdens and benefits to the land itself. The money, of, of course, if you're getting paid for it, you're getting some compensation. But the burden is the fact that someone's bringing their stinky chickens in the land. Don't mm -hmm. think about money. Think about land. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, ask me that like in a week, two weeks, okay? Trust me on this one. If I start talking about covenants, you'll get even more confused. I wanna, I'll do this as sequential as I can because the, the, the answer is not much. But there's subtle difference. I'll take like a day to explain. So let's use um, let's use an example. Okay, and let, let's I'll use this example over and over and over again. But I think it it's easier than Black Acre and White Acre. So you have Wet Acre, which has a pond, and then you have Dry Acre, which has sunlight, right? And, and Wet Acre is owned by A, and um, uh, Dry Acre is owned by B. I'm sorry, B owns dry acre. Okay, so we got this down. If there is an easement, and I'm going to spell appurtenant wrong, I can never spell it. Appurtenant means next to. If everyone knows, sees that word, that's what the word means, like, means adjacent to. So if there's easement appurtenant um, between these two parties, is it between A and B, or wet acre and dry acre? Sir, with the, the effect is? So if there's going to be an easement appurtenant in this situation, 
Who will be between? I'm sorry? I actually haven't been listening. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the whole situation? I'll come back to you. All right. Between the two properties. Good. So there will be an easement appurtenant between W and D. Why? And what does that mean? Good. Don't get tripped up. The easements are not between A and B. They're between W and D. <coughs> OK? So let's just try this one. Come back to it. If there's an easement in gross, let me scroll. If there's an easement in gross, who is it between? Yeah, be more specific. Who's who? Yeah, I don't know. And by the way, if like I'm going down the row and you're next, you should probably <laughs> pay attention. That, that's generally good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Ross, front row. Yes. So if there's an easement in gross. But is it between A or the land? Am I bringing my chickens to be watered on A or on Wetacre? On Wetacre. So, who is the easement between? <coughs> Which property? They're receiving the benefit from getting the benefit. Where are you watering the chickens? On the and what happens if the owner of Dryer moves? Does it matter? I guess with the easement. Uh, right. So the easements would be between Wet Acre and B. I'll explain why. The easement in gross says no matter where B lives, B is a farmer, no matter where B lives, he can bring his chickens onto wet acre and to water them in the pond, no matter where. It's not for A. A can move. Maybe A can move somewhere else. And in, literally speaking, you don't water your chickens on a person, right? <laughs> so it's going to be between the land that's wet and B, the farmer. So B moves somewhere else, he can still bring it. Yes, sir? Can you repeat the hypothetical time? Right, the hypothetical is right here. So there's yeah, wet acre. Yeah, well, you water chickens in wet. <laughs> right. Yeah, but bees the farmer. No, no. <laughs> so, so okay. So, so bees farmer. Does that help? And A is pond owner. How's that? that? I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Everyone get that now? I'll clarify. It. So B is a farmer. A owns the pond. Okay. No matter where the farmer lives. He can bring his chickens to be water on Wetacre because that will be an easement in gross. Everyone with me so far? I'm about to give you more vocabulary, so if you're not with me, stop me. So, yes, sir. The easement in gross would stay with B no matter where B is. Yes. B would be able to come That's to right. No That's right. <laughs> yes. Even if A sells Wetacre, it stays with Wetacre. That's the key. This stuff sticks with the land. Yes, ma'am. So it's always either going to be between a piece of land and a piece of land, or a person and a piece of land. That's it's right. Never going to be between a person and a piece of land. It can't be because we're talking about real property. The easement appurtenant is between two pieces of land, and the easement in gross between a piece of land and a piece of property. Okay, yes, ma'am. If both parties agree, to so say A and B, say, listen, you know what? We don't want to do this anymore. If they both agree, they can, they can basically kill the easement. And the reason why, think about it in terms of the bundle of sticks, right? A owns the land except for this easement, right? He owns all the sticks except for the easement, and B owns the easement. 
if they combine their interests on Captain Planet, like there, there's one, there's fee simple, and then the easement disappears. The same way, we'll do this later. If if B purchased A, right? I'm sorry. If if B purchased a uh, wet acre, the easement would disappear because it has fee simple. If the same person holds the land and the easement, the easement disappears. I saw another hand somewhere. So I saw at least one to the end. Should I not even mention covenants or no? <laughs> <laughs> Better if you don't. Because I'm already confused. Okay. What, what are you confused about? No, nothing. No, no, no. Tell me, please. Someone, if you're confused, someone else is confused. No, no, because no, you brought up covenants, and so for whatever reason, my mind's like going that way too. And so they're very similar, but there's some big differences, and I, I promise we'll spend like three days on them, okay. or four days even. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can. If you have a question about easements, go for it. Covenants, I'll say, come back later. It's for your own benefit. I, no. I promise. No, no, no. Okay, so everyone okay with this so far? <laughs> Funny cartoon someone just, just sent up. Yeah, it says, at the time we bought it, I didn't know what our easement was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll, we'll do a case with, uh, with, with, with railroads in a bit. I think maybe about three or four weeks. It's actually not, not, not dissimilar. I might use that cartoon. Okay, so now I'm going to explain the words of what I just described was. So I said, you know, which estate is receiving the benefit and which estate is receiving the burden, right? So, so there's, of course, horrible vocabulary you have to remember to know which is which. So there's a dominant tenement and there's a servient tenement. Tenement just means land, so don't worry about the word tenement. So, uh, oh, sir? In the case I just described, right? Where A has the oh, I'm sorry, wet acre has the pond, and that's where the chickens are going to be watered. And then B owns a piece of dry acre. Which would be the dominant, and which would be the Serbian tenement? I would think wet acre would be the Serbian. That's right. Why? Because they're having to let the other people come on. <coughs> yeah, I mean they're serving. It, it, the, the word's right in there. The Serbian estate is serving. It's allowing the other guy to bring his chickens on, huh? the farmers. Um, so, uh, uh, Morgan? Yeah. Damn it. My, and my cousin's name is, no, 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 my cousin's name is Morgan. I just saw her family this weekend at the funeral. Okay, so it's in my head, sorry. In this case, we, I try. We, which, would we, which would be the dominant tenement in the, in the, in the example I just gave? Uh, he said Wedeker was, was servient, which is dominant. Process of elimination. Yeah. Which one is it? Dry right. We're talking about we're not land, right? We're not talking about people. Don't give me A as a piece of, piece of land. It's not. We're talking about dry acre. Doesn't matter who lives on land. You have you have deeds and trusts that go back hundreds of years. People are people die. Land doesn't. So always think in this class in terms of land. Yes, sir. But if they sold, if, if A sold his land and B sold their land, and the new way, the new owners didn't have chickens, does that even even matter? To let your chickens what? come over and get watered if you don't even own chickens? When so so chickens so here? if a successive owner doesn't take advantage of the easements, that's what you're asking. <coughs> well, we'll talk yeah, about this in a bit. Farmer, you know. We'll talk about this in a bit. But if someone, okay, I'll ask you. Generally speaking, if someone doesn't use their piece of land for a long time, right? What happens to it? Or what can, what can happen to it? Average possession. The exact same thing here. If you have an easement to cross someone's land to go to a lake, right, and you don't use it for 10 years, the original owner regains it from adverse possession. It's called a prescriptive easement, and we'll do that a little bit. In the, it's mentioned in the case the, uh, with, the, with the sewage. So you can actually have a situation where you have an easement to cross to water chickens. You don't do it, but the owner of Wet Acre does. He brings his chickens every day. He actually will gain adverse possession of his own land. That might sound foreign. How can someone adversely possess their own land? The answer is they don't actually have that interest. The purpose of the easement is saying, listen, I own this entire land except for this one little right, this one, this one stick, where I'm going to say, I'm going to let him do it. And that's his right. <coughs> you can't block him. If you put up a fence 
on your own property to block the lake so he can't get to it, he can sue you for a trespass because that is his land. That's his interest. That's what an easement means. You are giving up a chunk of your land and not just a piece of it, but you're allowing someone to use it in a certain fashion. Everyone get that? Everyone with me? Okay. So far, so good. Even if there's no kind of payment for anything? Yeah. Well, that would, be the, that would be the terms of the easement. Maybe you can strike an easement for $1 a year, or maybe you can strike an easement for love and affection. What if it's like two buddies? Like, yeah, sure. And then it's like, wait. Well, that, that happens a lot. And I think one of the cases we do, one of the, one of the short cases that has, a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, come on over my property. Do whatever you want, right? Well, we'll write something down. And then they have a fight. And then what happens? Yeah, there's a problem. You have to be careful about that. Uh, I had, you know, uh, I had two deaths in my family this week. Another uncle of mine passed away three days before. Yeah. And uh, he, had, he had lived with him a live-in aid, um, uh, and she, did, she was from Poland, she didn't speak English, I'm, uh, uh, you know, not, not very educated, but after he died, my uncle died, she refused to leave. And she had been living there for almost a year. So my, uh, my uncle asked me, so what am I supposed to do? I was like, well, I, I don't know your property law, but I'm thinking, you got to take care of this quickly, because if, if, if you let her stick around there, she might actually have some sort of claim saying that she was allowed to stay there. And they said, "Oh, we'll just we'll just um, we'll let it, we'll just like get evicted." I'm saying, "No, no, 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 no. The, the lease is in your name. You have to go to you have to go through the eviction proceedings, and you're gonna get evicted. That won't kick her out, and you're gonna get in trouble." So I, I it's a bad situation. And I said, "If she's there for five years, she can squat." But uh, but but it's it's an apartment, so they'll probably. I told her remove furniture, you know, turn off the phone service, and I think she'll probably get the hint because she just wouldn't leave. You don't want to call the cops on her because she'll freak out, and she's old lady but <laughs> people make arrangements like my uncle when he let her stay there he didn't have anything on paper he said yeah you can sleep in the, the guest bedroom and you can you know take care of me cook whatever clean but yeah all right so everyone get the, these concepts so easement after tenant easement and gross dominant tenement serving tenement yes sir is there always going to be a dominant tenement even if it's in when uh, between marrying easement and gross, since that's between a person and someone else's property, that's right. Serving it. When no, that's exactly right. I was gonna get to that like in two minutes. Good. When they're so, let's go back up with an easement app or tenant. There will always be dominant and servant. Right, right. Because it's gonna be the dominant will be dry acre. And the servient will be wet acre. Both an easement and gross. Uh, uh, Landon, right? Yes. With an easement and gross, and we did this a minute ago, which is the servient tenement with an easement and gross? Wet acre or dry acre? The wet acre. No, yes, yes. The servient tenement will be wet acre. And to follow up from his question, is there a dominant tenement? Uh, no, because it's been the person. Good. Very good. Everyone see that? There is no dominant tenement. Why? Because the easement belongs to B. B is a person, not a piece of land. He's a farmer. He can't be a dominant tenement. So with the easements in gross, you're always going to have a serving tenement. There has to be. There has to be some piece of land being burdened. If there's no land being burdened, then there's no easement because there's nothing to happen. No one would want to burden a person. That's not real property. So there's no dominant tenement. Okay. How are we doing here? Everyone... Everyone with me? Yeah, everyone okay? All right. Yes, sir. So it sounds to me like the Serbian tenement will always go with whoever has the burden. Is that true? Mm, generally speaking, <laughs> but where it gets complicated, and we'll do this in a bit, is when there's a mutual benefit and a mutual burden. Think, listen, 
I'll let you water your chickens on my land if you let me install a solar panel on your land. Then it gets messy because who's benefit, who's not. And the same piece of land can be serving and dominant depending <coughs> on you look at it. So to oversimplify, yes, but if they do a mutual benefit burden, and so instead of exchanging payment, they listen, I'm going to burden you this way in exchange for you burdening me this way. Okay? All right. So we talk about easements. How do we actually create an easement? Um, the easiest part is that's been writing. And give you a little preview, something called a license. A license is just like an easement, except it's oral. It's spoken. It's not written. So if there's an exam question and something is oral, I will call it, it's going to be licensed. license. There's not going to be, don't treat it as an easement as a covenant. If it's oral, it's a license. It has to be. Why cannot be an easement? Ivan, why, why can't an easement be oral? What, what, what prevents that from happening? Is it a subject to the statute of frauds? Good. Yeah, what, 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 review, what, what statute of frauds? Good. Yeah. We're going to do the statute of frauds in like a lot this class. It's the same thing. It has to be a writing, it has to be signed by the parties to be charged. So you have an easement, right? Has to be in writing, write it down, and it's signed by the parties to be charged. This would be the owner of Wetacre and Dryacre saying, listen, I'm going to agree to burden Wetacre in exchange for you paying me or you do something for Dryacre. Statute of frauds. But, and here's one difference between easement and covenant. You can get an easement without it being in writing in a couple of ways. Covenants, you can't. Covenants have to be written. How, uh, Lance, right? Yes. How can you get an easement without it being in writing? Um, a continuous and open use of the land is not, uh, not challenged. What do we call that? Well, kind of like adverse possession, but. Yeah. Someone just walk through your yard and go to store or something, I wouldn't call that adverse possession. Okay, so. <laughs> the, the, the correct word is prescription, or also prescriptive easement. That's the same thing as adverse possession. It's just called something else. You can gain an easement through prescription. So if you cross the same piece of land every day, 20 years ago to work, you can actually gain a prescriptive easement. <coughs> okay? That one should be somewhat intuitive to you because we spent some time in an adverse possession. If you're using a piece of land every day, you're watering your chickens there, the owner knows about it but doesn't stop you, there's hostility, it's open, notorious, your prescription. Um, sir, what's the other way to get an easement not in writing? Uh, Chris? Oh. I'm sorry, I don't have my, my, my chart. Oh. What, what's another way, in addition to prescription? Estoppel? Uh, yes, but what, what, no, you're, you're on the right track. What's the broader umbrella in which estoppel's under? What do we call that? Yes, yes. Exactly right. So the easier one is prescription. Though that you guys know, you know about adverse possession, we studied that at some point. The implied easement is something a little bit probably new, but not really. It's saying if something should be so, then it's so. If there's some sort of estoppel or fairness argument, or the detrimental reliance, or there's some other reason why. Uh, the case we'll do in a few minutes with the sewage is what we might call an easement by necessity. That might be a case where, listen, like, we need to put the sewage there. They don't have average possession, but this is the right thing to do, so we're going to do it. It's effectively an equitable type of saying, saying it should be there. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. Let's just, let's, let's, let's court impose it. We shouldn't have this guy with eight inches of sewage in his, in his basement. That's just bad. That's, that's just a, it's a bad situation. Okay? <laughs> so there's different ways that, that, that easements can be done. So let's go back. Covenants, they can't be implied. Covenants. No prescription. You cannot imply a covenant by necessity. Do not write that on the exam. People did it and they were wrong. Easements you can. Covenants you can't. <laughs> covenants has to be in writing. Okay? All right, just remember that one bit. Know what a covenant's not before you know what a covenant is, I suppose. That, that's a terrible way of learning, but it'll suffice for property.
So let's start with the um, the, the Willard uh, uh, case. Yes, ma'am. No prescription. You can't you can't gain a covenant through the equivalent of adverse possession. You can gain it through. It's called prescription, but you cannot gain a covenant in that manner. Is that okay? Yes, sir. They do have to be in writing, but they can be implied, and they can be gained through adverse possession. So let me put it this way: If you and I agreed to make an easement, right? We have to put it in writing. It can't be oral. But say you and I don't agree to make an easement, the courts can come around and put one in afterwards. So in other words, if I want to make an agreement with you, you have to put it in writing. If we don't put it in writing, we have to go to court, and we have to have a judge say so. That makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. so you can create it by writing, two parties. You can create an easement by prescription, which is adverse possession, which is hostility, right? And you can also have a court apply it through a stopple or necessity or some other way. But yeah, that's a good description. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's no uh, covenant by necessity? No, no, no. I told them. No, no, no. I told them. No, no, no. I told them. That's, that's a now thing. Which it's, it's not. All right. Any other questions about that topic? Before we move on to the, the church case. Anyone? Okay. Uh, so, what happens... Okay, so, I'll set it up. So we have, we have a, a plot, of, we, have a, we have a block, right? We have the church here, we have a house here on lot 19, and we have a parking lot, or an empty lot on lot 20, right? This is a case that happens over and over and over and over again where someone sells a piece of land they don't own. It happens all the time. So, um, uh, sir, who owns lot 19 initially? Uh, yeah, the old lady, right? I, I don't know names. So the, the old lady owns lot 19 and 20, right? What's that? Church lady. Church. Yeah, it was like Dana Carvey. Satan, you know. <laughs> okay, so so the old church lady, afraid of Satan, you know, owns uh, lot nineteen and twenty. Okay, the old lady allowed people going to the church to use the parking lot to park there on Sundays. Okay, no 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 problem. She owns a lot. The old lady sells lot nineteen to uh, uh, Willard. I'm sorry, Peterson. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't skip this show. So, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. So, Peterson now owns lot 19, right? <laughs> what happens with Willard? Who's Willard? Right. So, so Peterson is a real estate developer. I'm sorry, Willard's a real estate developer, right? A realtor. And he says, hey, I want to buy 19 and 20, right? Does, does, Willard, does, does, does Peterson own lot 20? Does he sell it anyway? All right. This happens in every case. Someone's selling property they don't own. Uh, this was probably not by accident. You probably thought, oh, the old church lady will sell it to me. No big deal, right? Like, what does she need this random lot for? So after Willard buys lot 20 from the parking lot, he goes back to the old lady and says, oh, dear old church lady, can you please sell me this lot? And what does she say? Yes, and uh, ma'am, to that. So next, you call the church lawyers. What what does a church lawyer do? Uh, if you draw up a conveyance for an easement, good. good. And what did what did the what did the easement provide? Um, that people could park during church hours for the benefit of the church. Good. So uh, that's exactly right. So to put it in terms, would this be an easement in gross or an easement appurtenant? Um, it's yeah, think about it. It's, it's a trick. No, it's, it's almost it's a borderline trick question. Um, it's, it's between the land, using the land. And so, how would you characterize that? So that Very good. Not exactly, but it's much closer to easement and gross because it's benefiting the church. But 
generally speaking, you had to have it assigned to someone involved in the transaction. But we'll come to that in a minute. So, uh, and then so shown, which would be the dominant, which would be the serving tenement? Um, the dominant would be the land that's being used, so it would be the parking lot. All the way around. Oh. Would, no, I'm sorry. No, you, no, you're, no. Did I ask the dominant or the serving? Sorry, I'm really tired. Serving. No, so which one is the serving tenement? Um, the land that's serving others. So which would be the, the right, I'm sorry. I've got like four hours. Okay. So the land being served is a serving, it's the parking lot. It's unclear if the church will be the dominant because it's not really, it's a, it's a kind of easement and gross, kind of easement and tenant. It's kind of a weird blend. Okay? Okay. So they put this clause into the deed, right? So now Mr. Willard buys it. Is he made aware of this deed? Um, not at first. Not, okay, so, 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 so what tipped him off? Or what, what should have tipped him off? Yeah. Yeah, so we talk about like you know record notice and inquiry notice with deeds. Like, should you have known? If you see that a bunch of people parking your lot every single Sunday, that's probably something that put you on notice that something's up, right? Something's up. I don't know. What was that? Well, if you're the owner of a property, you should you should know what's going on in your land. Yeah, no, but no, you're right. I mean, maybe he never goes there on Sunday. Maybe he sleeps in on Sunday. Maybe you know he's a heathen of some sort. Doesn't doesn't go to doesn't go to church on Sundays. He should be going to the church and not trying to steal property, or whatever. So, so, but it was mentioned to him that the owner of the property mentioned, like, "Hey, oh, by the way, you know, some some church people park there every Sunday." Or we didn't think much of it. Would so, Anthony? Would anyone ever buy a piece of land that? Every week for say three hours on a Sunday, people park on it. What could you build there? You could do other stuff, I guess. Like what? Other than a parking lot. <laughs> other than a parking lot, what could you possibly build there? You mean you're talking about for three hours a day within Yeah, every Sunday for three hours from ten till one, or whatever what the hours are. What could you possibly build on a lot that has to have cars on it for three hours a week? Yeah, last semester people tried coming up with ideas of what could be done. Someone last year said a strip club and said you can have the strip club in the parking lot to have all the people come from church to the strip club. Someone said, what else? A, yeah, a drive through liquor store, that could work. Yes, sir. Allow it as a parking lot. What if you built something that kind of took up most of the parking spaces? Would you be in, in violation of that easement? What do you think? Uh, would you be in violation of the easement if you turned it into a parking lot and then charged for parking? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah. Well, what, what, what did the easement say? Go, go, to, go to the case. What did the easement say? It said you have to let the church people use it as a parking lot. Any fee involved? It didn't say no fee. <laughs> if you were to put up a toll booth, right, and collect a toll to go to the parking lot, you'd be violating the easement. If you were to block, build something to block the spots, you'd be violating the easement. And you could be then sued for that. So, so in any event, let, let's, let's go back. The guy says, okay, you know what, I'm going to go sue, right? They go to quiet title. What does the court do here? Or, or in some way, what makes this case more difficult than it should be. Why, why is this case not easy, open, shut? Okay, good. Good. Right. So it makes this weird. Is usually we talk about an easement between A and B, right? That's usually what we talk about, between A and B. What makes this weird is there was an easement between um, um, the, the, the church lady and, um, what's his face, Peterson, for the benefit of the church. I'll scroll. What makes this weird is that the benefit is going to a third party. We talk about the statute of frauds, right? Between A and B, the parties to be charged. 
Here, there's someone else in the picture. There's an easement between the church lady and Peterson. They're buying and selling, you know, they're, they're doing this transaction. But the benefit's going to a third party. And under the common law rule, you couldn't do that. Bradford, why do you think you couldn't do that under the common law? What, what, what's, what's bad about that? I mean, what's bad about that? It just seems like it would just kind of go on forever. If you're going to think that you keep switching it, it would never end. Whereas if it was just between two people and that person dies, it would be over. Right. How are you supposed to know, Aaron? How are you supposed to know what third parties are? So say, for example, to build on Bradford's example, say the easement was given between the church lady and Peterson and the, and the benefit of the church, right? What happens then if the church gives it to someone else? Exactly. There might be a gap in the record. When you have two parties, right, you have a grantor and a grantee index. You have those two books, those two big books, you remember, right? You know what you search for church lady, and you know you search for Peterson. But now, how are you going to go search for this? How are you going to, where does the grantee fit into the, where does the, chur, uh, the church fit in under the grant or grantee index? It doesn't really fit in anywhere. I mean, perhaps, perhaps he's viewed as a grantor of the easement, but not really. It's kind of a weird system. So under the common law, they didn't allow this. Yes, ma'am? So you're saying the church just means that they have that interest, then they could transfer that? Sure. It's an easement in gross. That's why I asked, shown that question before, it's an easement in gross, and it can be transferred. Because it was an interest in the benefit of not lot 20 whatever, but Church of Christ. So I had. Yeah, question. Is the church considered a person? Third person? Yeah. Yeah, the, the what, church corporation, but yeah. What about corporations? Aren't they not considered people? No, no, no. <laughs> Well, do not be mistaken. You know, everyone's probably heard of the Citizens United case, this thing. Corporations are people. That's nothing new. For purposes of the common law, corporations have been treated as people for 200 years. There's nothing new about that. And I'll give you one more. For a long time, corporations have had First Amendment rights. And there are studying New York Times versus Sullivan, Pentagon Papers case. These are cases where the New York Times is a corporation. It's incorporated in the state of New York. And they have First Amendment rights to bring suit. <clears throat> Nothing new since United didn't really change anything. People just got really upset about it. Okay, but to answer your question, corporations have been treated as people for a long time. So when I say a person or corporation for property, makes no difference. You you can vest the ownership of a piece of property in a corporation. That's not really a problem. Okay, question about this. So it's kind of a weird easement appurtenant easement in gross. But to answer uh, uh, the question. The church could then alienate that. The church could sell it to someone else. Um, if the church wants to sell it to someone else, do they need to tell a, uh, a church lady and, and uh, Peterson about it? I mean, I don't know because they're the ones that, it's, that the uh, easement was with. It was an easement gross. If, if, if they left and sold it to, I know, like, something like the Methodist church. Right. That wouldn't really, it shouldn't, it shouldn't break the easement, should it? Well, how is the easement phrased? What does it allow? Re re read the text. What, what does the easement actually provide? So, yeah, say, say this to a Methodist church. What does the easement provide? Um, kind of words and words. Anyone have it handy? <laughs> Aaron, a ladder, please. Um, such an easement Church purposes, right? All right? Let's run with that. So, so Steve's, if if the church, the Church of Christ, scientists sold it to a Methodist church or a Catholic church, would that fit within the language of the easement? It would. It's church if if the church sold that to a liquor store, could the liquor store use that easement? Okay, so let's be precise. They can sell it to anyone. Anyone can buy this interest, but unless they fit within the language of that interest, it won't work. So, uh, Jante, what if they sold it to a mosque? Would that fit? Synagogue? Uh, you know, uh, a, a Catholic-run homeless shelter. Mm. A Catholic church that, that runs a soup kitchen, maybe.
Yeah, but you're reading it very broadly. Church means church. Oh, people go against churches all the time. They're suing a church in this very case. Willard's suing a church saying, you can't have this parking lot, it's my land. So this gets into an interesting topic. How narrowly and precisely do we read the Eason Grant? If it says church purposes, does that mean religious purposes or church, which would mean a Christian, some denomination, house of worship? I don't know. So the church could transfer this interest, but have to be careful who they transfer it to. All right, so um, uh, how, does the, uh, how does the court, I'm sorry, I don't make my thing. How, how does the Supreme Court of California treat this old common law doctrine saying you can't have the benefit of the third person? What do they, what do, they do with that? Yeah, what, what do they say? What, what does the Supreme Court of California say? <laughs> Louder, please. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So they call this old common law rule in an apposite feudal shackle. Um, and they basically change the common law. They say, you know what? We don't like this. This rule doesn't make sense. Why shouldn't the parties be able to do the transaction the way they want? Why shouldn't the old church lady be able to give this land to Peterson or reserve an easement for the church? Why shouldn't that happen? And so there's no good reason. So, um, sir, under the old common law rule, how could this transaction have been done to avoid this third party benefit? Uh, under the old? Yeah. Yeah. How how could it have been done? What, how could they have structured the transaction? Well, they would have had to put the in each transaction. There are like, two, two steps. Two steps. How could it have been done? Well, put the easement whenever they transferred the property originally. Then again, they would have to put the easement again. Mm. Is that not? You're close. Know. Do you know? The, the common law prohibition said you can't reserve an interest of a third party. So how do you get, how do you do this? How, how do they do that? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, so it would be two steps, right? So a church lady gives a church, fee simple, right? And then two, the church gives uh, land to Peterson Reserving the easement. Right? Two steps. The church lady gives fee simple to the church. So the church now owns it in fee simple. And then the church can then give it back to Peterson, just reserving the easement for themselves. And that would have fallen under the common law rule. But you can imagine why the California Supreme Court said this is stupid. Because it just adds an additional necessary step. What's the risk here, of course? Uh, Rose? What's the risk here with doing this? Yeah, the yeah right? <laughs> they stop after number one. They say, hey, we got fee simple. Bye bye, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> so long. See you on Sunday. You know, they pay your tithings. You know, <coughs> there's a risk of doing this because if at, once a church has fee simple, <laughs> it's theirs. They don't have to give it to anyone. So what the, what the Supreme Court's saying is listen, we don't have to do this stupid, you know, uh, straw man purchase, we hand it back. It's silly. There's no necessary reason to do this. So we'll just let everyone do it right away. Okay? Um, yeah? But what's, Tracy, but what's the, what's the downside of reversing this common law rule that's, that's quite old? What, what, what's the, what's the difficulty of that? Right. Right, so there, the problem is that this common law rule has been around for a very long time, okay? People have what we call reliance interests. What's a reliance interest? People rely on the rule being such. So say for example, uh, uh, Kelsey, right? Mm -hmm. Say for example, you're the lawyer of um, Peterson, right? You're Peterson's lawyer, and 
Peter says, come to me and say, hey, listen. <clears throat> they drew up this easement, right? Is this easement valid? What would you tell your client before this case? Yeah. Right. So Peter says, hey, church, you know what? <coughs> you drew up this easement. I don't care. It's not valid. I'm going to go sell this land anyway. So perhaps Peterson wasn't as bad as he thought. He thought the church was being stupid. He thought, listen, the church lawyer messed up. Not my problem. The church lawyer made this easement. That's not going to be effective. I can then go give this to uh, a Willard. I have fee simple because she could not reserve the easement like this. So the parties acted in reliance. So really the person who screwed up was not Willard or Peterson. It was the church because they wrote a bad instrument. But the Supreme Court of California bailed them out. They bailed them out. They said, you know what? Even though this wasn't the case, we will treat as such. And it's generally a bad common law rule to be retrospective. Most changes in the common law are made prospectively. Why? Because people relied on this rule. This has been around for 100 years. There was no secret. This is how the law worked. And any competent lawyer would have told Peterson, saying, listen, let them sign this agreement. It's, it's absolutely worthless. It's not worth the paper it's written on. But now it's, it's valid. Okay. Questions on this case? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Louder, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the trend is probably to make these enforceable. The reason why, the general trend in majority whatever is enforce the things that people write. If they wrote this easement, let's enforce it. And this case was, I think, what, the 60s or 70s? 1972, yeah. So, I mean, th this is like 40 years ago in California, so it's probably pretty adopted by now. Okay, any other questions? That's good. Okay. So let's move on to licenses. Uh, okay. So, yes, yeah, so what's the big difference between a license and an easement? A uh, license is not uh, recordable. Or, um, you can't um, take it away. No. Well, what's, what's the biggest difference between how an easement and license are created? Is it the requirements of writing in an oral? Yes, exactly right. The second thing you said, I'll get back to in a second. Easements are written. Licenses are spoken. That's the biggest difference. They're, one's oral, one's not. You've all given licenses at some point in your life. You all have. If you let someone over to your house for dinner, <coughs> or you invited a plumber into your home to fix a toilet, or you invited a gardener to do some landscaping, those were all licenses. You didn't write anything down. You let saying, hey, listen, plumber, come to my house and fix my toilet, right? Say if the plumber fixes your toilet, then he sits on the couch and starts hanging out. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Sir, okay, what, do you, what do you do if the, the plumber comes to your house and won't leave? Uh, you uh, use force to get him out. <laughs> Maybe in Texas you call the cops, right? Or, or in the case of my uncle and the, the, and the, 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 the aide won't, won't leave, she was allowed in as under license. The most important thing between the two of them is you can revoke a license at will. An easement can't be revoked. An easement's in writing. It's there forever. If you have an easement to allow someone to come onto your land to wear their chickens, you put up a fence, you're liable. You'll be sued. If you let a plumber come into your apartment to fix your toilet and he sits around the couch afterwards, you can call the cops and kick him out. So generally, licenses are oral and can be revoked. Okay. Everyone get that so far? But, there's always the but, there are some cases where they can't be revoked. Oops. There's some cases where they can't be revoked. And generally it's because of sort of estoppel or fairness. And almost every case where 
a license cannot be revoked, it's because the licensee, the person who gets a license, improves the land. That's like 90% of the cases. There's some sort of reliance. You know what? You let me cross this land. You let me use this road. I improved the road. I repaved it. I put money into it. Courts will not revoke, will let you revoke that license. If you're just crossing a field and you have no interest in the land, fine, you can revoke it at any time. But if you improve the land, it's going to be harder to revoke. Okay? So, um, Pam, why would someone give a license rather than easement? What, what's the advantage of giving a license rather than easement? Yeah, what else? Right. It's not as formal. You can get rid of it any time. You can close it. You can change the term. Say, you say, you know what? Instead of crossing my land every day, you can cross it once a week. <laughs> or if you cross it, you have to do it at a certain time of day. You can change the terms. It's not in writing. And the most important part is you can revoke it. Saying, you know what? I don't like you anymore. Scram. Get lost. So licenses are what most people say. Yes, sir. So you say can't be No, no, no. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I should put an unless there. How's that? And there are very estoppel is a broad term, generally meaning equity, and there are various ways of doing it. Okay. Everyone with me so far? Yes, sir. How about Helbert for Taylor? Okay, we'll do that one next. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, back uh, uh, that row. Okay, so I'll, I'll call you in a second for the Holbrook case, but I'll, I'll set it up. So the Holbrook case from Kentucky, my, my, my previously lives in Commonwealth. Um, there are two issues here. So a person, Holbrook owns the land, and he lets someone else, you know, use the road, right? So Taylor is using the road. And he's using it for a lot of years. There's a prescription claim, an adverse possession claim. If you use the same road every day for 10 years, you can gain it through prescription, adverse possession. Um, Ma'am, I'm sorry. To, okay, so if I cross a road every day for 10 years, right? Every day I cross it the same way for 10 years. The owner knows about it and he opposes it, but doesn't stop me. What happens? So what do I gain then after 10 years? Do I own the road? No, you don't have right. In what manner? Exactly. So, for prescriptive easements, you don't gain access to the land. You don't own the road. All you own is the right to cross it in the manner which you've done so for 10 years. So say you, you walked across a field for 10 years, right? You gain through prescriptive easement. Then you start driving across the field. Can you do that? What, 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 what is that? What are you doing? You're trespassing. So let's bundle of sticks, right? The only right you have is to walk across that field. If you water your chickens in a field every year for 10 years, you'll gain a prescriptive easement to do so. If one day you bring cows, you can't do that because that's not the interest you have. The only interest you have is what you've done for 10 years. Everyone get that? So, so just pay attention to make sure that the use, the, the, the thing the person's doing, is consistent over all that time. Because say sometimes you drive across the land, sometimes you walk across the land, it gets messy. What exactly are you gaining prescriptive easement for? So in this case, um, the person was using, this, the, was using this road for many years. Why did the prescriptive easement claim fail? Ma'am? Why did the prescriptive easement claim fail in this case? What was what, what was missing? What was lacking? <coughs> was it the continuity? What else was it? Permission. Yeah, permission. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't that's right? It wasn't hostile. He was using the road with permission. You cannot gain adverse possession if you have permission. 
Mr. Robinson was in the house without permission. That's why he was going for adverse possession. He was on TV saying, I don't own this land. So they can't get it through adverse possession, a conscription, so they have to try to imply it somehow. Um, uh, how do they imply it? Well, how do they try to imply an easement? Through what means? Good. So what do we call that? What, what's, what, what kind of interest is that? So everyone know the phrase detrimental reliance? Remember that from contracts or, or uh, some other class? If you use something in a manner in which you rely on it to your detriment, in other words, you build a house on a piece of land, right? You improve the land. You install gravel or whatever, uh, what was it called, red something, I don't know, red dog gravel, and you repave, the, you repave the road. You have done stuff to improve it. So in this case, the court says, you don't only have a interest in um, the license, you also have an interest in the land itself. By putting your own money into this land, you have now gained an interest in the land. So because of that, what does the court find? Right. So generally, licenses can't be revoked unless some sort of estoppel, some sort of fairness argument. Here, the guy spent, what was it, $25,000 $25, house, he repaid the road, spent all this money, he has an interest. So generally speaking, to answer your question, um, where can a license not be revoked? When the guy spends money. If the guy spends it with some of his own money, makes it better, courts will reward that, saying, listen, you can't revoke that at will. Okay. Uh, sir, in the back? So, what's the downside to this holding? What do you think is going to happen to people giving licenses after this case? It's on the, it's on the case. Right. So the reason why a person would give a license rather than an easement is because it can be revoked. He might not know how, he, how long he wants to let this guy cross the land for. And saying, listen, my lawyer told me an easement... A license can be revoked any time. But now with this kind of holding, which is not new, it's not a novelty, if I let this person improve on the land, right, I can't revoke it. So, sir, do you think people will allow licensees to make improvements on the land now? No. Why? Because once that guy puts down the new gravel, he's there forever. It's as if he had an easement. And I didn't get paid for an easement. I only got paid for a license. Say I paid, say it costs $100 a year for a license and $5,000 a year for an easement. I'm short of that money. So probably what's going to happen now is say, if you know what? If I'm going to have all the burdens of an easement, at least pay me for an easement. And he's going to make people buy an easement from him, which are much more expensive, which will make it harder for other people to cross the land. Yes, sir? Right, and that's that's why it's a stop. It's an it's, it's an equity argument. It's a fairness argument. So it's, a, it's got. To be yeah. All right, everyone get that so far. All right, so there are a couple of cases come afterwards. We won't focus them too much, but there's the Shepherd versus Pervin case. I think Anthony mentioned that, or someone there mentioned it. Um, uh, close friends come together and they make an agreement. It's a friend, I love you. You can use my land whenever you want. And then they go to court where they always do. And the court said something like, um, the friend was not negligent in insisting in a formal transfer of rights. Um, don't do this. Have something in writing. It's not worth it. Friends come and go, but property is forever. <laughs> you need to have something in writing. Just, just don't do it. Um, the second case, the Henry versus Dalton case, mentions the spite fence. These are not too uncommon. Because if you have someone with a license across your land, you say, stop doing it, they won't, you put up a fence. And there are some cases where the court will say, you have to tear down that fence. You have to do you know, a corporate chip, and tear down the wall. Okay? All right. Now, uh, so, uh, sorry, yes. So when, in this case, effectively what happened was the license was transplanted to an easement. I'm sorry, the li license was transformed to an easement, right? Did the guy cross, did, did, the, did the coal company have to pay anything for that right? Here's the rub. 
I mentioned before, if he had sold an easement in the first place, he probably would have taken a lot more money than a license, right? Why didn't the court simply make him pay the difference? If, say, if there's a difference of $1,000 between the easement and the license, why can't they just make him pay the difference? What do you think, Randall? Yeah, why wouldn't that make sense? Why wouldn't that make the property owner whole? The guy who owns, who owns the road, he just took a hit. His, if he wants to sell this property now, right, he now has cloud on his title. There is effectively an easement on his land where there wasn't before. So his property value has dropped. Does he get anything for it? Right. So I think a better result would have been the course of, all right, you know what? You want the equivalent of an easement? Good, but now you pay for it. You pay for it. Maybe we'll discount the amount of money you invest in the land, but you've got to pay something for it. Because this clouds his title. When he wants to sell this road, he's going to have some difficulty selling it because of you. Because you're going to be there forever, and we're not going to get rid of you. We can't. If it had just been a license, we could have kicked them out. All right, everyone good with that? Hmm? Both parties who agree have to do it. No. The dominant and the servient, or, or, or the servient and the easement and gross guy, they have to come together and agree to it. And if they unify, they put together their interests, it cancels it out. Yes, sir? So as a lawyer, it'd be probably beneficial to come enter into some kind of contract, right? And like a personal contract that talks about the land, but it's not in but it's like the land. <coughs> uh, you see, you're trying to get around it. So you, you want to do an easement, but you don't want it to be an easement. Right, because it's not, I mean, like if you want to do a license, but you want to revoke it. But well, what you could simply do is say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, put in writing a license for a term of one year right. and see what happens. And then. Don't make it in perpetuity, in other words. Have, have, have an expiration. There's nothing wrong with having a term of years. Remember we have grants with a term of years? That's not a problem. Let's turn another hand somewhere. No one? OK. All right, the last case I'm not going to do in too much detail because it's more complicated than it's worth, but I like the facts. Um, so we have, we have these four lots, right? Lot four, lot 19, and lot 20. And originally, uh, Bailey, who's this old lady, it's always an old lady who owns houses, um, uh, and she owned lot four, she had a house here. The city puts down a sewer uh, along the main road, which is Highland Avenue. Okay? Anyone here from Tennessee? Anyone know where Chinook, Tennessee is, or Chinook? No, okay. So they put down the sewer. So a drain is constructed across lots 1920 going up to Bailey's house. Okay, that's fine. Jones purchases lot 19, so he's living under there, okay? He doesn't really know what's going on. Um, although, I guess one person can say, if you have sewage, you should probably know the sewage line underneath your house. That's generally, it's just got to go somewhere. So that's there. <laughs> Next, there's a, there's a drain connected. So at that point, he definitely knows that there's something connected. Okay, so that's Jones. After that, Murphy purchased lot 20. Murphy builds a house. Murphy is connected to the lateral drain. So at least Jones and Murphy at that point know that there's some sort of sewage system below it. And there are a number of conveyances. So the house ultimately is then sold, sold to Royster, and then this house is ultimately sold to Van Sant. Okay? Then the basement floods. And this is a very generous, pic pretty picture of blue water. It's not, he has six inches of raw sewage in his basement. Anyone ever have that happen? Like, like inches of raw sewage pops up in your basement? You don't have basement tanks. That's right. Oh my god. Or, or, or septic tanks. Overflowing septic tanks. Ever have that? Bad. Who cleans that? How do you even clean that up? I don't even know. Oh god. Okay, so there's a basement flooding. Okay. So in other words, Van and Susan enjoy it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in this case which isn't too important. But, but the takeaway is that you can actually get an easement implied by necessity. So there have been no, there have been no written easements. None. None was written, right? So let's go back here. I go to the last, the last frame. So there's no easement written. There's been no claim of adverse possession, right? What the court effectively has to say is, listen, the house in the corner, she needs to have sewage, right? We're not going to let her go with that sewage. She's been relying on this for a lot of years. So we will imply an easement by necessity. 
That's what it's called, easement by necessity. She needs the easement. There is no other way for her to flush her toilet other than having this pipe go into these people's houses. So we'll imply it. That's, that's the general takeaway. The more tricky part is how necessary does it have to be? And that's where it gets funky. Uh, in the back of the blue shirt, is it absolutely necessary for her to have an easement under this guy's house? <laughs> Why couldn't it go here? Why couldn't they have another pipe? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. So there's a difference between what, what's called uh, strictly necessary. <laughs> uh, and and reasonably necessary. <laughs> so <laughs> that came out when I was in law school. <laughs> so strictly necessary and reasonably necessary. Under the common, the old law regimes, something had to be strictly necessary. So say that someone had like a landlocked house, right? And the only way to leave this landlocked house was driving someone else's land. Otherwise, he had to take a boat and go across a lake. Lake, right? Under a strictly necessary standard, would the court imply an easement there? Is there a boat? Yeah, it's a boat. I thought you could make a good argument for strictly necessary, but it's not strictly necessary. If you get the land another way, I'll give you the other way. Right. So under the old regime, <coughs> it's on a landlocked house, right? And the only way he can get from his house to the mainland is by taking a boat. Then that's it. He has to take a boat. The court would not imply an easement across a private piece of property. Now, sir, under the modern regime, which is reasonably necessary, would the court make someone take a long boat ride or just take a short, short trip across a piece of land? <laughs> that's right. So there's a there's a kind of a, a difference between the old and the new approach, and and. And for an exam, do both of them say, you know, it would, it would not be strictly necessary, but it could be reasonably necessary, and that, that'll, that'll cover your, cover your bases. Um, some of these old cases are crazy. Like, they, they, they would require someone to climb over a mountain rather than having to just take a five-minute walk across someone's path. Um, and there's good reason for that, too, because by creating an easement, same as in the sewage case, same as in the, uh, case, the road case, you are decreasing his property value. He had fee simple, but no longer. No longer can he sell it without cloud of title. Okay? All right. Do we have any questions? Anything, guys? Okay. I'll see you on Thursday. Have a good day.